A significant amount of scientific research is aimed at understanding how the human body works and in finding new cures for diseases. Medical research can involve conducting experiments with other species, and these are sometimes referred to as model organisms. A large amount of research to benefit human medicine actually begins with organisms that are much, much simpler. Even studying single-celled creatures like baker's yeast can bring major benefits. Well, a model organism is one about which you have a lot of information, and it's because they have particular advantages for doing experiments. For example, the most simple systems, such as yeast, have an advantage in terms of they grow and divide very quickly. They are often cost-effective, and it's also a case that we understand their genetics. And in many respects, they behave exactly as, as we do, at least at the cellular level. That means that what you find out about a yeast can tell you fundamental things, for example, about the way cells divide. So you can very rapidly find things out which would take decades or centuries to do if you were to confine yourself to working on humans. As well as yeast, another popular model organism for research is the fruit fly, Drosophila melanogaster. Bambos Kiriakou, Professor of Behavioural Genetics at the University of Leicester, has studied Drosophila for many years. In 1900s, in the early 1900s, a guy called Morgan started working on Drosophila. So we've had 100 years of genetic background in Drosophila. So we know where every gene is on every chromosome. We can put genes in to Drosophila. We can take genes out of Drosophila. We can knock down all genes. We can make mutants in every gene that we like, in any tissue that we like. So it's the organism par excellence for doing genetic research. So yeast and fruit flies are two important model organisms alongside nematode worms, zebrafish, mice and various plant species. Research teams will often carry out a series of related experiments using several model organisms to benefit from the different advantages that each can bring to the project. As an example, consider work Professor Kiriakou carries out with colleague Flaviano Giorgini into Huntington's disease, a debilitating disease of the nervous system resulting in the early onset of dementia. The disease is caused by a mutation in a protein called Huntington. In trying to find agents that will help overcome the symptoms of Huntington's disease, they start by working with yeast before moving on to studies using Drosophila. So one of the hallmarks of the disease is um, obviously cell death. In the case of Huntington's disease, since it's a neurodegenerative disease, you see loss or death of neurons. And so what we can do is we can actually express a portion of the mutant Huntington protein in Baker's yeast, and what you see is cell death. So it mimics what's going on in the neurons. The fact that yeast has a small genome, that it divides rapidly and that ways to alter its genes are well understood, makes it an excellent organism for carrying out initial screens to identify potentially interesting new proteins. But when it comes to studying the effect of these proteins on the phenotype or symptoms of Huntington's disease, the fact that yeast is a single-celled organism starts to count against it because you can't look at the way changes in an individual cell affect the interactions in more complex bodies. At this point, the researchers need to take their candidate proteins, the ones that have sparked their interest during studies using yeast, and look at their effect in Drosophila. Of course, one of the limitations of the yeast is the fact it doesn't have a nervous system, and obviously there are certain symptoms of the disease that we can't mimic. For example, behavior, locomotor activity, these sorts of things, you can't really look at in yeast. So that's where we move into Drosophila, which is also a very, very powerful and well-defined genetic tool. But obviously the big benefit for us is that flies have a nervous system. So we can now start looking at phenotypes or symptoms in the Drosophila that more closely mimic what's going on in patients. The combination of doing work in yeast and Drosophila allows us to quickly look at many, many candidates, but then actually validate them very robustly. So studying simple organisms can give us interesting new knowledge that may prove beneficial for human medicine. Working with simple species can help scientists to gain a good understanding of the ways that cellular processes work normally and what goes wrong in diseases. In doing so, they can reduce the number of experiments that are carried out with higher species such as mammals or other vertebrates. In terms of our work, we'd like to see some of our candidates, specifically some of the compounds that we've identified recently that appear to be protective in our models, we'd like to actually see these tested in higher systems with the hope 
that then these could be moved on ultimately into clinical trials. And basically that our work now has hopefully served as a filter that we could been able to reduce a lot of red herrings, shall we say, and that we're able to identify some really strong candidates that are worthy of exploration in higher systems and to really reduce, hopefully in the future, the number of animal experiments that need to be done. At some point, however, there still comes a time when some experiments involving mammals need to be carried out, both to confirm the relevance of findings from lower organisms and to fulfil the legal requirements in the testing of new medicines. So model organisms are taking away the need for much research in higher organisms, in mammals. But one has to remember that model organisms are often very simple and that humans are more complex organisms. But usually the studies in model organisms lead us at least in the right direction to know what experiments need to be carried out.